Hello everyone, uh, my name is Catherine and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar today on integrated prediction of phase one and two metabolism. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to the speakers for this webinar and I'm really pleased to be joined by Matt and Mario from our Optivium team. Matt has a Master of Science in Computation from the University of Oxford and a PhD in Theoretical Physics from the University of Cambridge. He has led teams developing predictive models and intuitive decision support and visualization tools for drug discovery. In 2009, he led a management buyout of the Stardrop business to found Optibrium, uh, which develops novel technologies and groundbreaking artificial intelligence services to improve the efficiency and productivity of drug discovery. Mario is our principal scientist here at Optibrium. Uh, he has a background in computational chemistry with a PhD in natural sciences from Tallinn University of Technology, where he's also held roles as a lecturer and a research assistant. Since joining Optibrium in 2017, Mario has led much of the company's research and development efforts into metabolism prediction, developing new models based on quantum me mechanics and machine learning for predictive modeling. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your introduction, Catherine. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, joining us today in the audience. Um, those of you who know me will know this is a, a subject uh, very dear to my heart, having started my PhD back in the mists of time looking at predicting drug metabolism. Um, so it's great to, to welcome Mario to join us. Uh, Mario uh, joined us over six years ago to lead the work we have on uh, predicting metabolism here at Optibrium. Uh, and so I just thought before uh, we get started, Mario, with the, the main presentation, maybe you could just tell us a, a little bit about the journey that you've been on over the past six years. Yeah, certainly. Um, so as Catherine told us, um, the, the whole metabolism project started in 2017. And, and back then we started with UGTs. And, and this was actually a collaboration between us and Lhasa Limited at, at Leeds. Um, and I think around like a year or two years later, uh, we were uh, joined by a year in industry student, Peter Walton, um, who started working on FMOs. Uh, and these two projects finished around the same time and, and they were quite successful. So we thought that we'll keep the snowball rolling. And then and we chose aldehyde oxidases as our next system we wanted to study. And around the same time, we were joined by James Surrey, another year in industry student, uh, who started working on the uh, models for preclinical species. And, and last but not least, we had yet another year in industry student, uh, Sylvia Kemp, uh, who worked on sulfur transferase as well. Uh, I worked on the which enzyme model, which uh, I will talk about later on as well. And, and I think within those six years, we, we have a very good coverage of the kind of the uh, drug metabolism pie, if I can call it like that. So, um, so yeah, and, and I think one of the reasons we have managed to essentially build as many models as we have is, is, is due to the, the framework, which is essentially based on the, the already existing P450 models, but we have kind of developed and upgraded the, the, the framework to, to fit all of the other models as well. So, so, so yeah, I think that's a, a good summary of the history of, of these many, many different projects. Yeah, it's been it's been a great team effort, uh, and we should also uh, remember to uh, mention uh, 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 Peter Hunt, our director of computational chemistry, who's been involved in guiding the project uh, all along. Uh, it's also great to see so many contributions from from students. In fact, they were undergraduate students and did some really cutting edge research, which during the presentation has been been widely published already. So um, yeah, six years on now, Mario. Um, great presentation coming up. Does that mean you're you're done with drug metabolism now? Uh, certainly not. Um, I mean, maybe I've played too many video games, but I like to think of the, the metabolism as, as different eras in, in Octibrium. And, and definitely the first era was the era of P450 metabolism. Now, this is the end of the second era of the, the additional, uh, additional um, uh, enzymes. And then we'll see what the third era brings us. So on one hand, we still have many uh, minor or lesser enzyme families which take part in the metabolism of drug-like compounds. Um, but the problem so far has been that we haven't really found a lot of data for, for these enzyme families, or I should say publicly available data at least. Uh, um, 
On the other hand, maybe we'll concentrate more on, on upgrading our current models and making them uh, better, more transferable, faster, and so on and so forth. But I can confidently say that it's not the end. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, with that note, um, I think it's time to, to get on with the show. So uh, over to you, Mario. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll turn on the, the pointer option here and let's go to the next slide. And, and this is essentially the, the overview of today's presentation. Um, I will talk about the importance and challenges of drug metabolism and drug discovery. Uh, and then we'll talk uh, about the models uh, with uh, uh, published and will publish uh, sooner or later. And then I'll hand it back to Matt, who will give you a, a sneak peek to the Optibrium's latest developments in, in the metabolism prediction. And in the end, we'll have a Q&A session where you get the chance to ask questions from uh, me and Matt. All right, so let's get started. The integrated prediction of phase one and phase two metabolism. And I thought we'll dedicate the first two slides to um, introduction uh, of metabolism and drug discovery and, and the common questions which people might ask. So um, the role of metabolism essentially is very straightforward. It's, it's for elimination of endo and xenobiotic compounds. And we have numerous enzyme systems or our families to eliminate these, uh, these compounds. And this is because of a uh, a myriad of substrates for, for, uh, for uh, uh, our body, which we need to get rid of. And, and the main idea behind metabolism is that we have to increase the solubility of a compound. Um, and the main challenges of drug metabolism in drug discovery is that uh, a, lot, a lot of the times our compounds uh, are getting rapidly metabolized, which leads to high clearance or low bioavailability. Uh, then we also have to watch out for potential drug-drug interactions, and we'll talk about that later on as well. Um, obviously, the formation of reactive or toxic metabolites, this is something we'll, we want to avoid. And, and in general, the impact of uh, genetic polymorphisms on, on exposure. Now, the main questions which uh, people have asked us and, and, and probably ask each other as well is that which enzyme families are responsible for the metabolism of my compound? Uh, my compound is metabolically unstable. How to improve its metabolic stability? And, and if so, do we need to design a new compound? Uh, and how to design a new compound? Um, how can we reduce the risk of drug-drug interactions? Um, uh, we need to identify compounds with multiple routes of clearance, um, which means that do they get metabolized by different enzyme families or maybe different enzyme isoforms, um, then which metabolites will be formed by my compound? And, and this often helps scientists with the metabolite ID experiments. Um, and also, are any of the metabolites toxic? So because as I said, we really want to avoid this. And last but not least, uh, if we're going to choose preclinical species, which species should I choose for, for my uh, pharmacokinetic uh, studies? Um, and these questions are important. And actually, we'd like your input for these questions as well. So I'll hand over to Catherine, uh, who will uh, conduct a second poll. Uh, so please, Catherine. Yeah. Um, so everyone should be seeing a second poll on your screen right now um, and it's asking which of those questions uh, are the ones that you're, um, you're you're most interested in learning more about so looking at uh, which enzyme families are metabolizing your compound how to improve the meta the metabolic stability of your compound how to reduce the risk of drug drug interactions uh, which meta metabolites will be formed from your compound and which species, species will give appropriate coverage of metabolites for you. Um, so you should all be seeing that poll on your screen at the moment and I can see about 50% of you have voted so far. Okay, closing this poll down in three, two, one. So interest across the board, um, but the one winning out uh, out of all those questions is how to improve the metabolic stability of your compounds. Um, but lots of interest in, in all of those questions. So back over to you, Mario. Uh, thank you. It, it's, it's really nice to see that we have interest in, in all of the questions because we're going to talk about all of them. 
Um, but before we start talking about models and how to use them, I, I thought with a few slides, I'll also explain the, the modeling principles we use at, at Optibrium. And I should say that I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty details. If you're really interested in those, then I'll show you some reference, references to some of the papers as well. But we have another webinar which really talks about the methods. Uh, but here I'll just uh, share two slides. And then first, I wanted to talk about the two ends of the modeling spectrum. So on one end, we have the empirical methods, such as statistical modeling and machine learning. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the mechanistic approaches, uh, such as molecular dynamics or, or even quantum mechanics. And the pros of having the, uh, or using the empirical models is that they're really fast and they're really easy to set up. However, the, the downsides uh, are that we do need a lot of data, which I already said before that we in metabolism don't really have that much data. They're non-transferable and they're qualitative. Now we could fix that uh, by using mechanistic methods because me using mechanistic methods, we can build our models on smaller but high quality data sets. Um, these models will be transferable because they're based on physical principles and they will be quantitative or, or semi-quantitative. Obviously, the, the, the downside of using mechanistic approaches uh, is, or are, is that they're very slow or, or, or super slow, especially when we're talking about uh, methods such as density functional theory. But also, they require a detailed understanding of, uh, of the uh, enzyme systems, uh, which we don't always have. And that's, a, that's why at Optibrium, we're trying to aim somewhere in the middle. So we're trying to find the sweet spot of those two uh, ends of the modeling spectrum. And this is something what we call the reactivity and accessibility approach. And the reactivity essentially uh, means that we want to simulate or estimate the reactivity of each potential site of the metabolic reaction. Uh, and here on the right, you will uh, see a video of uh, uh, quite common uh, FMO substrate TMA interacting with the simplified cofactor for FMOs. And we do that by using quantum mechanical uh, method uh, AM1 in the case of FMO, for example. And this means that these calculations are transferable because they're based on real physical principles, they're quantitative. However, since we're using a, a very simplified model, they are independent of the isoform uh, of the uh, enzyme family. Now, to take these uh, uh, isoforms uh, or the structure of the protein into account, we use accessibility descriptors um, and they capture the effects of orientation and steric hindrance. So orientation in the sense of how the molecule orients itself in the protein pocket. And these obviously are dependent on the isoform of the enzyme family. And these descriptors are two-dimensional descriptors which are rooted on each site of metabolism. And we take those two types of descriptors, combine them with empirical data and use machine learning models uh, to train our models. And these models are trained on high quality data and they're rigorously tested using independent test sets. Now, if you're interested in additional information, as I said, there's a webinar, but there are also publications for you to go through. Uh, but we're in this presentation, we're more interested in the, the models and uh, their performance and how to use them. And we'll start with the, the Stardrops P450 model. Uh, which is an existing model in, in the uh, Stardrop uh, suit of software. Um, and I should say that the P450s are the most important enzyme family because they're responsible for phase one metabolism of approximately 75% of hepatically cleared drugs, and they do metabolize a wide range of potential substrates. Uh, the P450 models, as I uh, told you before, are part of the first era of metabolism at Optibrium. And they've been available in Stardrop since uh, 2005. And they've been developed for uh, over more than 20 years. And they achieve really good accuracy, accuracies. We're talking over 90%. And how they work, we have a nice example here as well. Um, essentially, we have models for seven uh, major human P450 isoforms. And what they do is they identify sites of metabolism, uh, sites of metabolism. 
We also have the WHP450 model, which predicts the uh, major metabolizing isoform for a specific compound. And last but not least, we have this metabolic landscape, uh, which indicates the vulnerability to metabolism uh, to guide the redesign of, of molecules. And if we look at the image here, uh, essentially this is uh, exactly what I just talked about. In the upper, uh, upper part here, we have our molecule, which interests us. And here we have the results for the which P450 model. And for this specific molecule, uh, the models predict that uh, the two isoforms, which are going to metabolize this specific compound, are uh, 2D6 and 2C19. And as you can see, two sites, which are labile, are the C1 over here, uh, which gets mostly metabolized by 2C19, and the uh, C9 here, which mostly gets metabolized by uh, 2D6. Uh, Stardrop also produces the metabolites for you. And as you can see, uh, this is the metabolic landscape, which kind of hints that if you want to do something, uh, um, then you should concentrate on this carbon over here. Now, these are the models we already have, uh, but if we want to kind of cover a, a larger part of metabolism for both phase one and phase two, we need to start building new models. Um, and there are a few ways how to do that. Um, what we did, we, we uh, essentially studied the number of articles published, uh, and this is represented by the table down here. And then we also looked at the metabolism of uh, top 200 drugs and all approved drugs. Um, and these are the pie charts here. And I should uh, say that these pie charts exclude the P450 enzymes. And obviously we also listen to our clients. And, and one of the interesting things here is that, well, obviously P450 kind of dominates uh, the, the, the number of uh, uh, articles published. Um, these two methods agree with each other, but they don't correlate 100%. For example, uh, MT, which stands for methyl transferase, uh, has the second largest amount of papers published, but you can't really see methyl transferase on these two pie charts. It's probably under the other enzymes, uh, but the researchers um, who um, put this specific uh, uh, paper together um, didn't think it was important enough to, to give its own label. Um, so what we did, we kind of look at, looked at the, the, the papers published, uh, the, the top 200 uh, drugs and the proof drugs, and came up with these uh, four uh, enzyme families, aldehyde oxidases, flavin-containing monoxygenases, uh, both in phase one, and uridine diphosphate glucuronosyl transferases in phase two, and sulfur transferases also in phase two. Now, in the next slide, I will explain why did we choose those uh, four enzyme systems. So let's start with aldehyde oxidases. Uh, first of all, azo heterocycles um, are very common in drug-like molecules, and, and aldehyde oxidase loves azo heterocycles. Um, second of all, people often uh, want to reduce the P450 metabolism, uh, which makes them introduce azoheterocycles into their compounds. Um, so this is yet another reason to choose aldehyde oxidase. Uh, but I guess the biggest reason is that uh, in recent literature, we have seen many um, uh, cases with unexpected high metabolic clearance of compounds due to aldehyde oxidase. And, and I actually have an example for you uh, later in this presentation as well. So we'll talk more about this uh, later. Uh, then flavin containing ox uh, monoxygenases or FMOs. The reason why we chose those is because they have uh, a huge overlap with the substrates uh, of P450s. And historically, there have been many incorrect assignments of metabolism. Um, often people assume that, hey, this is a uh, a metabolite for P450s, while in reality, it's actually a metabolite for FMOs. And this is actually a neat trick which helps researchers to avoid drug-drug interactions, uh, because if they know that, hey, this molecule gets metabolized by both P450 and FMO families, um, then this is good for drug-drug interaction or to avoid drug-drug interaction at least. Um, then in some publications, people also claim that uh, FMO metabolites are generally safer 
uh, than P450 metabolites. So maybe medicinal chemists, chemists want to guide their uh, compounds towards FMO metabolism rather than P450 metabolism. Um, however, ironically, FMOs are also able to generate uh, uh, very toxic metabolites such as uh, sulfines and sulfines. So you got to watch out for those. Um, then I think UGTs don't really need an explanation because uh, they are the most important enzyme family for phase two. Um, but there have been concerns with acylglucorides. So, so if uh, your compound has carboxylic acid, then it would be nice to check it out if that gets metabolized or not. And last but not least, the sulfur transferases. Uh, first of all, they did share 10% uh, uh, in, in one of the uh, pie graphs I just showed you, but also they have an overlapping, uh, sorry, they have overlapping substrates with UGTs. And this yet again is a, uh, a nice way how to avoid drug-drug interaction for, for your compounds. Um, but there's another reason. So the PAPS, which is the cofactor for sulfur transferases, is dependent on inorganic sulfur in your body. Uh, which means that if your drug gets metabolized only by sulfur transferases, then this might deplete uh, the inorganic sulfur in your body. And I guess medicinal chemists would like to avoid this. So let's talk about the models. So as we already told you, this, uh, this work is the culmination of over six years of research uh, to essentially extend the principles of P450 metabolism or modeling the P450 metabolism uh, to additional enzymes. Uh, and I will talk about the accuracy and the quality of the models in a second, but I just wanted to say that uh, we are now covering approximately 80% of reported human phase one metabolism and around 60% of the reported human phase two metabolism. Now here we have uh, the results for all of those uh, models we have uh, produced uh, in the, the recent six years. And I guess the easiest uh, statistics to uh, look at is the accuracy, uh, which is the orange one over here. And as you can see, in all of the cases, our accuracy is greater than 80%, which I personally think is, 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 is really great. Um, although I should say that uh, at Optiprium, we're not usually uh, looking at the accuracy, we're looking at the kappa value, uh, because these models are classification models. Um, and the kappa value is really good at assessing how good of a classifier your model is. Uh, and at top tip, we kind of consider a kappa value of 0.6 to be um, a good indicator that this is a model uh, which is excellent. And you can see all of those uh, kappa values here, and this is the, I guess, dark blue or, or, or black color. Um, are above 0.6. So, so we're really happy with those models. And if you would use those models, this is what it would look like. So in this case, we have run this compound through all of those uh, 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 models. And you can see that the P450s uh, give us uh, percentages, uh, as we saw in one of the previous slides. But UGTs and sulfur transferases uh, give us um, yes or no's. So these sites are getting metabolized by UGTs, and this site is also uh, getting metabolized by sulfur transferases. Now, if we continue, uh, then we thought that we have all of this data we've gathered from the literature. We can also put together the which enzyme model. And the idea behind the which enzyme model is that if you have a compound you'd like to study, then this model will uh, uh, predict which enzymes are most likely to be responsible for the metabolism of your compound. And, and this is very similar to the which P450 model, which uh, we already have in, in Stardrop. Um, and both of them are QSAR models trained on high quality data sets, which means that they're really, really fast. So, so you can use that and with less than a second, you, you have your results for, for uh, a lot of compounds. And if we're talking about the statistics, uh, then the area under curve for both of those models are above 0.8, which yet again is great. Um, and if we're looking at the top one and top two values, uh, then in both cases, the top one is above uh, 0.7. 
and the top two for which enzyme model is really close to one, which is which is good. And and this kind of shows you that uh, if we make a prediction, then in more than 70% of the cases, we will get the uh, uh, correct enzyme. And in almost 100% of the cases, uh, the enzyme which will metabolize your compound will be either the uh, most likely or the second most likely metabolite in, uh, sorry, uh, uh, enzyme family in our predictions. And just to give you an example of how to use those models, I, I chose this molecule with a very interesting name, BIBX13A2. It was a clinical drug candidate under investigation for the treatment of cancer. And it's a really interesting paper by Hutzler and, and co-workers. I, I definitely recommend reading it, but uh, I'll give you the gist of it. So this was a compound which was very promising. Uh, it passed routine pharmacokinetic studies and they used rats and dogs. Uh, unfortunately, it had extremely low oral exposure in humans. And this was caused by rapid metabolism by aldehyde oxidase. I tried to find the amount of money which was used to uh, uh, go through the whole process. I, unfortunately, I didn't find it, but I, I think it's probably millions of dollars. And now I will present to you a, a hypothetical scenario of the same research if the researchers would have had access to our models. So they already have this clinical candidate and, and they're certain that it's, it's a really good molecule. Uh, and the first thing they would have done is let's run it through the which enzyme model. And if they would have done that, they would have found out that, hey, wait a minute, this specific molecule is highly likely to be metabolized by aldehyde oxidases. So instead of using rats or dogs for their preclinical pharmacokinetic studies, um, they would have used other species because rats have low aldehyde oxidase activity. And according to publications, dogs are devoid of aldehyde oxidase activity. So our guess is that they would have used either rhesus monkeys or guinea pigs because they have similar aldehyde oxidase activity to humans. Now they would have realized that, wait a minute, this molecule gets cleared really quickly from your body. So, which means that they would have used our aldehyde oxidase regioselectivity model and optimized the molecule accordingly. So our model gives uh, the following prediction. Um, it gives two sites of metabolism. It's not too sure about this site here, um, as the probability is 0.67, but it is very sure that this site will get metabolized as the probability is 0.87. And indeed, this is the case. Uh, this was the metabolite uh, reported in the paper I quoted before. So using these two models uh, would have probably saved them millions of dollars. Uh, now, this is all cool. However, this was an example of only one model, or actually two models, the which enzyme model and the aldehyde oxidase model. But what we want to do is we want to combine the 15 regioselectivity uh, models with the which enzyme and which isopore models. And our goal here is to predict metabolism networks uh, uh, for the first and second generation. And here on the right, you see a, a very simple example of how it would look like. So we have uh, the parent compound. Uh, the first row is the uh, first generation and the second row is the second generation. And within this work, we wanted to derive heuristics to maximize the sensitivity and precision uh, of our predictions. And sensitivity means that if a metabolite is experimentally reported, what is the chance that it is also predicted? And precision is of the predicted metabolites, what proportion are reported experimentally? And um, we thought that we'd like to give sensitivity uh, more weight because we want to predict as many major metabolites as possible. And the reason why we just don't throw everything or all of the models to, uh, to the compound is because if we use all of the 15 region selectivity models and uh, ignore uh, the specificity of the predictions, then taking a simple example, uh, this molecule, which name I unfortunately cannot pronounce, um, 
In the first generation, we will generate 16 metabolites, which is reasonable. Uh, as a medicinal chemist, uh, you can go through them and analyze them um, and, and conclude uh, something from these predictions. However, if we take those 16 metabolites and run them through uh, the models again, we will generate 146 metabolites. And now if you imagine the, or actually let's just go back to the uh, previous slide and you know you look at this specific uh, uh, metabolism map, then it's easy to understand what's going on. Now imagine the same thing, but with 146 metabolites. It, it's going to be very complicated to analyze that. And on top of that, in the experiments, they only had four reported metabolites. So we have a really good sensitivity. We predict all of those four metabolites. However, we do have a very low precision, uh, 0 0.027. And this means that we predict 37 more times metabolites than they actually reported in the experiments. So that's why our task is to refine the predictions, reduce the number of metabolites predicted, but we have to make sure that the relevant, meta sorry, relevant metabolites are still predicted. And that's exactly what we've done. Um, and our strategy was to gather as many roots of metabolism as we can find, and we used Kimball for that. Uh, we found 241 roots. Um, however, only 91 of those were deemed acceptable uh, by us. And, and we had a lot of problems with skipped metabolites, missing metabolites, extraction errors, and so on and so forth. Um, what we did, we took those 94 roots and we did a five-fold cross-validation study uh, where the approximate ratio for training and test sets was uh, 80 to 20. Um, and we also had an external test set. Uh, we had 15 parent compounds from the work of Jolin. And this is yet another paper which I would um, suggest you to go through. Uh, I gave the uh, reference uh, to that paper here. And the uh, image of cyclosporin here is just to show you that we didn't shy away from from huge or complicated molecules. So we, we literally took everything we can get the, our hands on. Um, and as I said before, the goal was to derive parameters uh, from the, the five-fold cross-validation study to maximize the sensitivity and precision. And the result looks something like this. So we used those heuristics to combine predictions from the which enzyme study and the which P450 uh, models. Uh, and the region selective models. Uh, we want to automate this process after two generations um, and obviously the option to add further generation for specific metabolites will be possible. And what we want to do is we want to present this nice pathway for uh, metabolism where you can see that in the center here we have uh, the uh, parent compound. The green metabolites here are the uh, first generation of metabolites and the second circle here, uh, uh, the, the pink metabolites, are the second generation. And one interesting thing here is that uh, sometimes the first generation of metabolites, they can converge into uh, a second generation here. You can see uh, this metabolite and this metabolite here uh, actually will uh, converge into this single metabolite over here. Now, if we talk about the statistics of the uh, heuristic study, then our ideal scenario would have been where we get the sensitivity close to 0.8 and precision close to 0.2. Uh, and I should say that with the five-fold cross-validation study, we actually did that. Uh, um, the, the average uh, uh, training set sensitivity was uh, 0.75 and the test set sensitivity was 0.77. Uh, precision was slightly lower, 0.17 and 0.14, but it, it's still uh, fairly good. And the external uh, test set, uh, the sensitivity uh, was 0.79 and precision was 0.09. And just for comparison for you, we, we compare the external test set with Biotransformer, which is a, a freely available tool uh, online uh, if you want to use it. Uh, this is the link uh, from where you can use it. And it achieves the same sensitivity. However, the precision was 0.05. So it kind of predicts twice as many metabolites on average uh, to achieve the similar sensitivity. So all in all, I think we did pretty good. And 
just to conclude the study, let's go back to the metabolite that which I showed you before. Uh, remember, in the second generation, uh, without heuristics, you would have to go through 146 metabolites, uh, which gave us horrible uh, precision. But if we apply those heuristics, which we uh, gathered from the five-fold cross-validation study, uh, then in the first generation, we would only generate six metabolites. And in the second generation, uh, we would generate additional 19 metabolites. So altogether, we would have 25 metabolites. And the sensitivity, so one, that's great. And uh, the precision uh, rose from 37-fold overprediction to six-fold overprediction, making it fairly straightforward to analyze those metabolites. And last but not least, I also talked about preclinical species. Uh, so we put together uh, models for preclinical uh, species, and, and these models are based on the same principles as the human P450 models. Unfortunately, we did have insufficient isoform-specific data for, for, uh, for rats, dogs, and, and, and mice. So what we did, we kind of put together general models for those species. Um, the AUC still are pretty great, and, and one might ask, like, if those are general models, how did you get so uh, good AUCs? And, and our theory is that most of the uh, predicted metabolites actually are from uh, uh, either one isoform or, or two prevalent isoforms, and that's why the AUCs are so good. Uh, however, this allows us to easily compare human sites of metabolism uh, with uh, other species, uh, helping you to decide uh, which preclinical species should I exclude uh, or include in my studies. So, to summarize, uh, let's return to our initial questions. Uh, which enzymes are responsible for my compound's metabolism? Uh, it's the which enzyme and which P450 models. And as I said before, they're really quick to run. Um, my compound is metabolically unstable. How can I design a new compound with improved metabolic stability? And we have cytometabolism models for P450s, FMOs, aldehyde oxidases, uh, UGTs, and sulfur transferases. And we also have the P450 lability uh, uh, model. How can I reduce the risk of drug-drug interactions? Yet again, you can use the which enzyme and which P450 models to see if your drug gets metabolized by only one enzyme family, or if it does get metabolized by P450, does it get metabolized by only one isoform or more uh, than one isoforms? Which metabolites will be formed from my compound? So you can run uh, our heuristics um, and generate the first and second generation of metabolites um, and, and analyze uh, your either uh, metabolism ID results or just see do we have any uh, re reactive or, or maybe toxic metabolites uh, which are likely to be formed. And now, last but not least, uh, which species are most likely to give me appropriate coverage of metabolites in my preclinical toxicity studies? And for that, we have the preclinical uh, species P450 models. So, yeah. Um, this concludes the, the presentation part, and I'm excited to announce that uh, we are going to release a new metabolism module, which will be arriving in autumn 2023. Um, and this module will include generating a single generation or two generations of metabolites. And now I will exit uh, the pointer option, and I will give the controls to Matt who will give you a sneak peek at Stardrop's new metabolism features. Uh, so thank you. Thanks very much for a, a great presentation, Mario. I'm just going to take a few minutes to show you what all this great science actually looks like in practice. And what I'm going to do is fire up a, uh, a pre-release version of our Stardrop software. Um, this is hot off the uh, developer's sort of ongoing work. So uh, it's uh, it, not ready for release yet. Um, there's lots more sort of fine tuning to do and testing and making sure that it's bulletproof before we uh, make it available to, uh, to our customers. But I just thought I'd show you uh, what the current state is. Uh, and hopefully you can sort of see how we can translate the science and, and actually make that really easy for you to access and, and visualize and, and work with these results. So uh, what you can see here is um, 
uh, star drop for those of you who know it and on the right hand side I have a data set of compounds I've just got in this data set 14 compounds here um, and now what you can see for each of these compounds they have been run through all of those uh, models that Mario just described and we can see in the table for each of them a sort of a summary of those predictions for metabolism so here you can see the uh, which enzyme model the which p450 uh, models that p450 metabolic landscape and then the predicted sites of metabolism by the predominant drug metabolizing uh, enzyme that is predicted for those compounds so you can get this summary looking through all the compounds but of course you can start to drill down and see that in in more detail so if you pick one of these compounds and on the left hand side you can now see all of that information in more detail and begin to interact with it more as well so let's look at this compound here this is uh, one of the uh, the compounds that was uh, in the slides uh, in into caterol um, what you can see immediately, if we look at the which enzyme prediction, this pie chart here on the left-hand side, you can see that predominantly it's expected to be metabolized by, well, conjugation, so UGT or sulfur transferase. So as Mario described, there's a big overlap in the substrates for these enzymes, and so we can't distinguish between them, but we can tell you that those are, are likely to uh, conjugate this molecule. But there's also likely to be a significant contribution from cytochrome P450s. And... If it is metabolized by P450s, the predominant enzymes are likely to be 3A4 here, uh, and the, the sort of lighter blue there is 2D6. That information is taken together with these cytometabolism predictions to create the regioselectivity plot above here. So what you can see now on the structure where I'm indicating the uh, most likely or the, the major sites of metabolism uh, for this compound, uh, in this case by uh, P450s, there we go. That's what I was expecting to see. Uh, not only the P450 metabolism, uh, but also the uh, sites of conjugation. So up here, you can see it's likely to be conjugated by both UGT and sulfur transferase. If I point to that, you can see the resulted uh, conjugated metabolites uh, and probably uh, UGT down here uh, as well. Whereas for P450s, the predominant site of metabolism is this uh, alpha position on the ethyl group, um, you can see is the uh, major site of metabolism, possibly for 2D6 at least, significant metabolism up here, giving the uh, hydroxylated uh, product as well. So we can very quickly see what that pattern of metabolism, metabolism is likely to be um, and uh, which metabolites are likely to be formed in this case in that, that first generation. And Mario also mentioned for our P450 models, we get this extra information on the lability or vulnerability of those sites in absolute terms. We can see two highly labile sites here, the, the red bars, and if I point at those, you can see they correspond to those symmetric positions there, the alpha position on the ethyl group in the bottom left. And the yellow site is moderately labile, and that is that aromatic position near the top of the compound as well. So it's very easy to interrogate this. Now, this by default shows you the major um, enzymes and isoforms likely to be responsible for metabolism, but you do have complete control about what information you want to see. Uh, so here in the display tab, you can actually look at lots of display options for which enzymes you want to look at, show them all. You can go in here, for example, if I drill down in more detail, I can look at the non-P450 isoforms individually. Um, for the UGT models, we do distinguish between the different UGT isoforms. And so you can see here for 1A1, 1A9, and 2B7 uh, metabolism here at this uh, oxygen. But in fact, this one here is predicted to only be uh, site to metabolism by 1A9 and 2B7. So you can drill down into that sort of extra rich information. Finally, I should also say that once you've generated these nice images and done the analysis, you want to get them out and into your slides or reports, you can simply right click here, you can copy that image and paste it into your slide, and paste it into your Word document, whatever that might be. And um, if you want to drill down on those metabolites further, we do produce a list of all the metabolites with the enzyme or isoform responsible for that metabolism, so the ratio information as well, so you can see all of those details. You can even uh, export that into a data set 
So I can create a new data set here in Stardrop. Um, and here you can see again all the metabolites. And also for convenience, we're outputting the exact mass of that metabolite as well. So you can go and look for that in your, your MetID experiments and your, your mass spec traces as well. So we're trying to make it very easy for you to just get this information out and use it to analyze your results in, in different ways. So this compound we've been looking at uh, is metabolized by UGT or and sulfur transferase and P450. Let's look at one that is predominantly P450. This is another example that um, uh, Mario showed in the slides. So this is uh, meanserin here. Again, just a reminder, we've got two isoforms responsible for metabolism. So here we see 2D6 uh, and 2C19. It's quite interesting here because we see quite different patterns of metabolism with uh, 2C19 responsible for metabolism at this uh, methyl group, which will lead to an, an N-demethylated product, whereas 2D6 is predominantly responsible for metabolism at this aromatic position, leading to an, an aromatic hydroxylated product as well. So this is what we see in, in humans. Um, and the other example that, uh, that Mario mentioned was the ability to predict metabolism by uh, non-human species, excuse me. And so we can look at those by clicking here. And now we can see side by side the prediction of metabolism for uh, rat, mouse, and dog, as well as for humans on the left-hand side. And so now we can see these models are slightly more qualitative because as uh, Mario mentioned, we don't have that sort of very uh, precise isoform specific data. So here we predict the primary, secondary, and tertiary sites of metabolism. And so if we focus on the primary sites which are highlighted, we can see here that if we want to get coverage of both of those positions, we should be looking at the, the rat or the dog, um, because the mouse doesn't, uh, isn't predicted to metabolize in this position. Uh, dog also has two other primary sites of metabolism, whereas rat has, has one other uh, adjacent to the nitrogen in the perazine. And so probably our best bet here would be to uh, look at the rat to get the same sort of coverage of sites of metabolism without producing too many more extraneous metabolites. Of course, we'd want to validate that experimentally, uh, do some uh, studies in microsomes, for example, but it provides us that quick guide as to uh, which species we should be focusing on. So with that quick tour, we want to make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for Q&A. So I'm going to jump back into the slides and I'm going to hand over to Catherine to run the Q&A session. Thanks, Pat. That's great. Um, so, yeah, we've got some questions that have come in. Um, we've had a question in on how many compounds are the models trained on? And this question came in whilst you were presenting, Mario, on uh, which enzyme and P450. Uh, so would you like to take that one? Yeah, sure. Um, I think we're, when we're talking about which enzyme, uh, then it's appropriate to ask how many molecules were in the training set. And, and in this specific case, I don't remember the exact number, but it was over 1,500 molecules. Uh, now, if we're talking about regious selectivity models, then it's appropriate to talk about sites because we're not training on molecules, we're training on uh, sites of metabolism. And and now I don't know the, the answer to the P450 models because they were uh, at the Tiburium before my time, but I do know, for example, for aldehyde oxidases, we had around, I think it was 900 sites of metabolism. Um, so yeah, and then there were about uh, four to six sites per compound on average, so you can work out the compounds as well. Okay, great, thanks. Um, the next question that we have is for you, Matt. Um, and it's, can you flag a potential site for formation of a reactive metabolite? That, that's a really good question. So uh, obviously our models can predict uh, the formation of potentially reactive metabolites, but then flagging uh, potential sites and really highlighting them is, is another challenge. Uh, it's actually part of our ongoing research is to look, for example, at uh, glutathione um, uh, reactivity and, and glutathione transferase activity. So we're not quite there yet, uh, being able to say how reactive a site uh, is likely to be, um, but uh, that is certainly very high on our list of uh, priorities to, to get there. Great. Um, another question for you, Matt, is on um, how can we actually use these models? 
Uh, yeah, really great question. Uh, so I just gave you a quick demonstration of um, the, the new metabolism module within Stardrop. It's a very pre-release version of that. It's well on its way to being developed. And as Mario said in his final slide, we are very much uh, expecting to be able to release this in the autumn. If you want to try them out, please do get in touch and we will let you know as soon as they're available. And if you're interested or willing to be a beta tester as well, um, please do um, you know, let us know. We're, we're always looking for people who are willing to kick the tires and, and give us some feedback. So, so get in touch and uh, uh, I think we'll, we'll have some contact details on, on the final slide um, in, in the presentation, but info at octubrium.com will, uh, will always will always work. Great. Uh, loads more questions have come in. Um, so just taking a look, which one's next? Uh, do we have monkey or guinea pig preclinical species models as well available? Um, Mario, perhaps you can uh, take that one. Uh, yeah, so we went through the, the publicly available data for pretty much all of the species we could think of, which are used in the preclinical studies. And rats, mice, and dogs were pretty much the only uh, species for which we found enough data. Um, now, this is certainly interesting, and, and we're going to keep our eye out for, for additional data all the time. Um, but for now, we, we only have preclinical models for those three species. Now, if you do have some interesting data, or you can point us to the right direction, please let us know because we would love to do that. Great. Um, another question for you, Mario. Uh, so you mentioned that your QSAR models are trained on high quality data set. Uh, can you give a bit more detail on that high quality? Yeah. So when we started with the, the UGT studies, uh, then Essentially, what we did, we, we scoured through through all of the, the published papers, and we were looking for uh, studies where people uh, essentially uh, report metabolized, uh, metabolites, and we had to be uh, sure that when they reported metabolites, then they, they actually proved within the paper, then they also saw this metabolite in their experiment, because in a lot of the experiments, you have metabolites where experts uh, think that this is the metabolite they, that they see. Often you see metabolites where uh, uh, people saw that, that this, oxi uh, sorry, this aromatic ring got oxidized, but they don't know which site exactly. So we excluded these studies. Uh, then uh, there were also studies with uh, unreasonable concentrations of, of these molecules. So if, if, you, um, if you essentially throw enough of these molecules at any of those enzymes that sooner or later something will happen. So we excluded the, uh, the studies where the uh, concentration of the substrates was essentially unphysical. Um, and there were one type of studies which we also excluded. Let me think, uh, was there anything? Oh yeah. Sometimes people uh, report metabolites as metabolites which were formed in humans, but if you go through the fine details, then you actually realize that uh, these metabolites were uh, observed in, in rats or mice or something like that. So, so these are essentially the, the things we really, really looked out for. And, and, and that's why we also claim that these uh, data sets are high quality because we really, um, made an effort to, to uh, study the, the reports and make sure that we don't have any false flags in, in, in our data set. Uh, I, I think that pretty much covers it, right, Matt? Or, or do you have any other yeah, ideas? Yeah, no, I think you, you covered it well. And uh, I can just sort of illustrate that with some of my experience from the, the P450 world, which is, um, you know, if you look at the literature for P450 cytometabolism prediction, you can find some really quite large data sets with cytometabolism data. Uh, we couldn't rely on that. We actually went and, and rechecked the literature on every single molecule in those in those data sets and found many examples. I think you mentioned an example which was reported as a human 3A4 substrate that uh, was actually measured in, in rats. Um, 
you see examples with, as you say, these very um, unphysiological concentrations where you're sort of ramming the compounds into the active site, sometimes multiple compounds into the same active site. And, and again, that will just give you very different patterns of metabolism from that which you would experience um, in vivo. So yeah, you just have to be very, very careful looking at every single publication for every single compound. Great, thanks. Um, the next question, uh, one for you again, Matt, can you predict the rate of metabolism? Yeah, uh, well, I wish I could say yes. Uh, the answer is not in general terms. Um, so actual rate of metabolism, even if we're looking at, say, microsomal stability, which is predominantly P450, um, in that case, there are so many mechanisms and so many contributions to that rate of metabolism that predicting it directly from structure is a, a huge challenge. Um, we have tried many times um, as more data has become available to build a model that would be sufficiently accurate for us to be confident and happy to share that with our with our users. Um, and we ha it hasn't reached the quality that we would be happy with. You do see some examples of the, the very large pharma companies uh, publishing and creating models of, say, microsomal stability. Uh, they tend to be classification models, sort of high and low, and they tend to be based on tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, even there, the statistics are uh, good enough to be useful, but but borderline, I would say. Um, you know, it, it is a very, very big challenge. Now, we are constantly looking at it with the new results from these latest edition of the models and predicting that sort of, or estimating that's a reactivity. Uh, we believe we have more quantitative descriptors that can, can possibly help us to build better models. There's, of course, more data available now than there ever was before. So we are constantly revisiting that question. Where we have had some success is building local models of rate, because within an individual series of compounds, for example, usually only one or two of those mechanisms are rate limiting. Um, and there we've had some, some great success of building local models that combine, for example, the output of our P450 models with things like uh, PKA, uh, lipophilicity, size and flexibility of the compounds to make really very good predictions that have been able to guide the selection of, of metabolically stable compounds. Uh, we do have a, a couple of case studies on our website uh, demonstrating that. But in terms of a global model that will predict a broad range of chemistry, uh, we haven't reached a point where we're, we're satisfied. Thanks, Matt. Um, I think we'll try and squeeze in one more question there, but then we'll have to wrap up and answer everything else uh, via email. We've, we've got so many questions that come in, so that's great to see all the enthusiasm. Um, so one last question. Uh, is there or will there be an API server so that the models can be integrated to other platforms? That includes numbers and perhaps images. That's a really good question, and that is certainly on our, our development plans. Right now, we're focusing on getting uh, Stardrop out, um, but these calculations are actually, they do actually run on a server, and of course, there is an API for that server that, that Stardrop relies upon. Um, and so, yes, uh, you'll have to wait a little bit longer, but yes, we will. We do plan to create a, a you know, a, an, or publish that API so that our customers can access the same results um, via the API um, and, and not have to process everything through Stardrop. But, um, but uh, that is a little bit longer than, than, uh, than the Stardrop uh, version. Okay, fab. So uh, thank you both for, uh, for being here and, and speaking today. And we had someone ask for a shout out um, to thank you, Matt, for your ongoing support of medicinal chemistry education for early medicinal chemists, including mine at the high school level. Um, so just <laughs> gonna do that quick shout out, uh, but thanks everyone for attending and we hope you enjoyed today's webinar. See you again next time.